Good afternoon. My name is Jim Frederick. I am the editor of Time International, and it is a great honor to be with you here today. The name of today's session is Advancing Africa's Trade Agenda, and I am honored to be joined by such a distinguished panel. Today we will be chatting about some of the challenges and opportunities facing trade within Africa and between Africa and the rest of the world, specifically trying to hone in on the question today of how can the continent advance its regional and global trade agenda. Today we have about 75 minutes to discuss these topics. So for the first 45 to 60 minutes, uh, I will be conducting a, a moderated discussion. Uh, and with anywhere between 20 to 30 minutes to go, I'll be taking questions uh, from the crowd and comments from the crowd. Uh, through it all, my hope is to build a lively discussion, to uh, build it almost as a dialogue. So I encourage my panelists uh, to build off of one another others' answers, if they have something to add or contribute, they need not feel as if it has to be a very regimented, I say something and then somebody else says something for five minutes and I have to wait. So, um, you know, your uh, assistance in, in building this as a dy dynamic dialogue I think will be gratifying for panelists and audience alike. Uh, before we get to the matter at hand though with the first question, I'd like to introduce our panelists. And in the interest of time, because we do have so little time to discuss so many ideas, uh, I'll give just the briefest of, of their titles. Uh, much fuller biographies are available in the, uh, the packet that we were given upon registration and are available online. So in order to my left, I'd, I'd like you all to welcome um, Mekinen Manyazwal, who is the Minister of Industry for Ethiopia. Then to his left, uh, ha we have uh, Pascal Lamy, Director General of the World Trade Organization. Then we have Dr. Mahmoud Issa, Minister of Industry and Foreign Trade for Egypt. Then we have Jay Shroff, who's the Chief Executive Officer of United Phosphorus in India. And finally, we have Jean-Louis Ekra, President and Chairman of the Board of Directors of the African Export-Import Bank. So I'd just like to kick off now uh, by asking Pascal, as we were discussing what to talk about during this panel, we're just going to jump right into it uh, and ask you, um, what are some of the barriers and what are some of the issues? Because you know, looking at it in the cold light of day, you indicated that net-net, African countries don't in fact trade with each other very much or nearly to the degree that they could or they should. Could you just lay out for us what some of the fundamental issues are, why that's the case? Um, very simply, I believe that the African trade agenda for the two or three years to come is a one-item issue. Uh, I think um, we, we don't have a mic on him. Can we get a mic on him? I think you need to speak. Do we get... Uh, there we are. There we are. So let me repeat. For the two or three years to come, I see the... African trade agenda as a one-item agenda, which is boosting intra-African trade. And there, the issue is not so much on the diagnosis of what needs to be done, but on how to get it done. Now, the diagnosis is now absolutely clear. Uh, and we've had years and years of studies of uh, cons consultations, we know where the problem lies. Huh? They lie in infrastructure, they lie in procedures, uh, border administration, uh, they lie in regulatory discrepancies that hamper trade and economies of scale, for instance, in the sanitary and phytosanitary field uh, for the whole agro-food uh, supply uh, chain, and uh, that's about harmonization. Uh, and uh, it lies also, and that's more recent, in uh, trade finance availability. Uh, trade finance is the oil of trade, and there is, uh, for reasons which we may come back to, a potential problem there given the new uh, financial uh, regulations which are developed worldwide. So, diagnosis, again, pretty clear. 
question is, how do you get this done? You need a strategy. Africa has a strategy. The AU summit in January developed a very clear roadmap so that the AU umbrella is there. We know where most of these initiatives have to develop, which is at regional level. Regional economic organizations have to take the lead and address these various problems one by one. What this needs is political energy. Huh? The key to removing these bottlenecks, to easing trade, to addressing these obstacles one after one lies in the necessary political energy of regional leaders to do that. If you want an example of how it has worked better than elsewhere, East African community, because this is a place where there is no doubt in the political leaders of the region that this is a priority. The other area where could help to get this done is, of course, more business engagement. Uh, if, I, if I look at the map of the world from the WTO, in all continents, there is a strong business constituency pushing for trade opening, but for one, which is uh, Africa, where, for a variety of reasons, this strong bottom-up push is not yet there, hence the importance of organizing uh, businesses so that they can lobby in the right direction. And that's what uh, PAFTRAC, which probably uh, Jean-Louis Ecrat, who was at the initiative of this, uh, of this push, can talk about. So I think we really should focus our attention on the building the necessary energy. That's what, in my view, still uh, missing, and it will happen as a function of the uh, amount of political and business energy which will be devoted to that. Great. Thanks for that. That's a great, I think that's a great introduction and can frame the rest of our discussion that uh, among a lot of people, there's a, there's a good idea of, of what needs to be done. The question is, is how to get it done. And you ran through a number of issues, everything ranging from border administrations to regulatory discrepancies, uh, trade finance uh, barriers and pure political will. So um, Dr. Issa, I'd like to, to turn it to you. Among that list of uh, barriers to trade, you are among those who are on the front line of trying to fight this trade fight every day. What would you say are you know, the one or two or three things that you find most difficult in, in to use Pascal's uh, uh, formulation of, of not trying to figure out what to do, but how to get it done. In fact, as an African, we live with Africa problems, especially for trade. In fact, Africa should have a target to increase its share with world trade. As we know, the world trade with Africa is less than 4% also should have a target of having trade between African countries, not less than other continents like Asia, like uh, North of uh, America, like, not like Europe, but to reach levels as a target. Secondly, the main problem actually is Africa is suffering the infrastructure. Trade without infrastructure will be always as intentions not as plans and uh, accomplishments. The infrastructure for many African countries is very weak. To have laboratories, to have standardization, to have regulation, you should have infrastructure for each country and help should be submitted from other countries to build the infrastructure for each country. There are many African countries, they have good uh, infrastructure, but many others, they don't have. You can't engage people without infrastructure to be part of a trade uh, with aim, as I am mentioning. <clears throat> the main problem is, for example, for standardization. We have an African organization for standardization, which is 
also. It's very weak because of financing. They can only survive their wages, but they can't do standards for Africa. Of course, we used to say that international standards should be the standards we should follow to be part of this world. You can't trade with world with a local standards or regional standards. You should trade with the world by international standards. Therefore, harmonization of Africa standardization with international standards is a big issue and it needs uh, and uh, it, it is fulfilled what Mr. Pascal let me mentioned about how get it done. You can't get it done without doing these things. Yeah. Africa should not be competing each other in their production. They should integrate and coordinate to have to increase their production. They should have policies. We hear many of intentions actually in Africa for such uh, increasing trade, but of course, to have it done, it needs what we uh, we, we we should do for this. Uh, of course, to 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 attract African countries, they should feel what they can accomplish from being part of of this uh, world. This is, in short, I can see that without infrastructure, you can. If we look for uh, other uh, regions like EU, they have, of course, a, 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 a unified body to, to issue regulations which are committed for each country to be using. Therefore, each country to still have its own regulations, it will hinder changing goods between each country. Therefore, Africa needs a lot of things to do by themselves and by countries who want to help Africa to be part of this world. This is what I can say in this issue. Great, thank you. Um, Mekinen, uh, as I believe uh, roughly uh, Dr. Issa's counterpart, uh, literally and figuratively, you two should be speaking the same language. Uh, so would you agree? I mean, we heard from him, infrastructure, international standards are key to promoting intra-African trade. Would, would, would you point those and, and some other planks to be uh, the major initiatives for, to use Pascal's framework, or to actually get it done? Um, I, I do agree with uh, what uh, my Egyptian colleague said. Uh, infrastructure is basic. The issue of trade is co competitiveness. You have to be competitive. Uh, in order for trade to take place. We have to reduce uh, costs. So infrastructure is basics for, uh, I think I must add uh, that what is it that we trade? Can you speak up a little bit? Okay. Uh, I, I, I do agree with uh, what he said. Mm. Uh, infrastructure is basic. Uh, standards are basic. Uh, I must add institutional capacity to manage the trade to facilitate the trade. And I ask, uh, what is it that we trade? So supply side issue it becomes important. Mm -hmm. We produce coffee, tea, Kenya produces coffee, tea, Uganda produces. So what can we trade? So the issue of increasing productive capacity, diversifying uh, our products uh, is key uh, for trading. So we should specialize diversify uh, our economic base. So that is where I think most of uh, the issue lies. Mm -hmm. And uh, investment in our productive capacity, uh, enabling the private sector to invest uh, in, in productive capacities. And while government has to facilitate this in terms of investment infrastructure, uh, customs, logistics, and the human development aspect also. Mm -hmm. The infrastructure needs to be designed, managed, implemented by skilled human resources. The logistics, the institutions need to be manned by people who have the right skill, the right mindset. And so uh, I think the issue is more multi-sectoral mm -hmm. and complex. Great, thank you. Uh, Jean-Louis, mm -hmm. as, uh, as we were chatting about this panel, uh, one of the things that Pascal laid out was uh, the barriers to trade finance. Uh, you indicated that you had um, 
things to say and issues uh, about trade finance and the complexities therein. Could you, could you add something about that barrier specifically? Yes. Uh, first of all, many African countries have their own currencies already, which is an impediment because to trade among themselves, they need to settle that trade in a third currency. Uh, Besides, among commercial banks, for some historical reason, the banks, let's say, in uh, English-speaking countries and the banks in French-speaking countries would have to settle the trade through their parent in Europe. So there are efforts to be done to improve the clearing among themselves. And this is a role that a bank like ours is playing by uh, allowing banks in various parts of the continent to feel more secure about instruments that will be issued by other banks uh, by this simple fact that our bank will add its confirmation to that. That is one of the points. Another point which uh, Pascal Ami uh, alluded to is the private sector involvement. We need to have a private sector, an African private sector, not only that speak to each other, but also speak with one voice when it comes to uh, a, a position at the WTO level. That is why we have uh, spearheaded the path track, which has a support of WTO and ITC and the African Development Bank and UNECA. Those are important because once the African private sector talks to itself, then there are grounds to improve, to increase the level of transaction among themselves. With the, the financial crisis, many African banks have seen also their line of credit uh, reduced by the international correspondent. So there is something to be done there uh, in the context of uh, Basel III that is coming, which is uh, stopping and the expansion of uh, credit lines to uh, African uh, traders. To give you some figures, a bank like African Export Import Bank, before the financial crisis, the demand for our facilities were in the tune of $3 billion dollars on average. In 2009, it increased to $15 billion. As I'm speaking to you today, we have a pipeline of demand of $18 billion, essentially because African banks uh, do not find alternatives. So uh, I, I believe that these are areas which also need to be addressed concretely, if we are to expand into our African trade. Finally, I would like to add one more point. Uh, most African countries have remained commodities exporters. You take a product like cocoa, between Ivory Coast, Ghana, Nigeria, and Cameroon, those four countries control more than 70% of the output of cocoa in the world. Now, how do you get Cote d'Ivoire and Nigeria and uh, Ghana to trade among themselves if they continue to, to export raw cocoa? So there is a need to transform that cocoa into a product, not a commodity. So that the, and, and you can multiply this example. So that's what I wanted to add to what uh, Pascal Labit said. Okay. Great, thank you. Um, Jay, your, your company is headquartered in India, and so you, I think, can be very beneficial here in the discussion to talk not just about intra-African trade, but intercontinental trade. Uh, so, what do you see from a country from, and a company uh, based, based in India as, as some of the impediments for not just trade within Africa, but Africa's trade with the world? Thank you. Um, 
Yes, we, we've uh, been doing business in Africa for more than 25 years. And, uh, you know, it's, it's a challenging environment. And I believe that there are some simple things, if uh, are done, it would uh, reduce the cost of doing business. And reducing cost of doing business will eventually give uh, uh, the African uh, Union lower cost of goods. So I believe that harmonizing the regulatory environment uh, is one of the key issues, and I think it's been brought up, brought up by my other panelists, um, that you know, the, the, today uh, for uh, us to bring technology to Africa uh, is, is a very costly uh, process. We have 52 countries, each one has its own regulatory environment, and we have to follow that, and that is, becomes uh, very costly to bring uh, good, efficient technology to uh, the farmers who need it the most. Um, and I think th those sort of things will really uh, uh, make it very efficient and also, uh, uh, as I said earlier, uh, reduce the cost of doing business. I think the second thing is uh, that uh, Africa is, uh, you know, the future uh, center for food production. Um, you know, on one end, we are talking about marginal farmers. The countries are still importing food. On the other hand, we are targeting uh, exporting food. And other than uh, infrastructure, I believe that a harmonized approach and a targeted approach for uh, agriculture production will really help create the right infrastructure, the right environment, also the right expertise. So even countries like Brazil, they are world's largest exporters. They export maybe three or four com commodities. Um, I think each of the African uh, regions, as a region rather than country, needs to decide their priority, build an expertise, create a center of excellence, and what will happen is that, uh, you know, they need to target markets. They need to go to India, find out what India needs, what China needs, and then target their agricultural production towards that. Um, this will create a center of excellence. It will also create uh, an environment where a global uh, supply chain companies or agri-business companies will come and invest in sectors where, uh, where, where this, uh, you know, they, they will know that, okay, I need to uh, create infrastructure, uh, value-added products for cocoa, for example, or for pulses for India or uh, cotton or rice, uh, whatever uh, commodity they focus on. That, uh, I mean, other than that, you know, you have specialist farming companies. They need to know that Ethiopia is focusing on, uh, say, sunflower or some other commodities, uh, cotton or, uh, you know, any other uh, sugar. And, and they will come in and you will get expertise which will really help improve productivity. This will also train the local people because o over a period of 10 or 15 years, you will have a lot of indigenous expertise devel developed around this, which will help to increase uh, global trade. People will come to regions in Africa and say that I, if I want rice, I need to go to Mozambique. If I want uh, cotton, I need to go to West Africa. So I think that will create uh, a focused approach and, uh, uh, you know, will, uh, will, will create an environment where they will automatically receive the infrastructure from, from the global companies who, who specialize in those commodities. The other thing which, uh, which uh, is not talked about and it's a bit controversial uh, is uh, biofuels. I think Africa has probably the most amount of landlocked countries and a lot of agricultural land. I think looking at biofuel policies will also help save a lot of foreign exchange, a lot of oil imports. Uh, it will also give a tremendous cash flow to small farmers and, and the local, uh, uh, you know, uh, rural economy. I think this is something which uh, is, is not talked about, and I believe that having a good biofuels policy will, will create uh, a, a huge amount of uh, local, um, you know, surplus and also jobs and, uh, you know, create a, a positive environment. Great. <clears throat> Well, now I'd like to try to drill down a little bit because we, we've talked about the difference between knowing what needs to be done and actually getting it done. We've identified some of those problem areas. 
But now I, I would like to ask some, some more specific questions. You know, for example, uh, you know, harmonizing a regulatory environment or currency barriers or uh, similarity of goods this is particularly uh, a tantalizing topic to talk about. So because you went first, I'll, I'll come back to you, Pascal, to, to ask what are the practical solutions to an issue that's seemingly as simple yet as intractable that two countries say, well, I produce coffee, uh, well, I produce coffee, so you should produce something else. No, you should produce something else. How, if we're trying to get to practical solutions, how does that work? Do, does uh, uh, a, a, an, an African-wide council get together? Is it, is it hashed out between Ministry of Industry versus Ministry of Industry? Is it an issue of political will? If, if, if this is what we're here to talk about, how does that function actually work? And because I know that a lot of people on this panel uh, have probably sat in those meetings, we'll come back to them as well. So, so let's, let's move to the next phase then. Look, I, I totally agree. I totally agree. Uh, uh, uh. Still have the we have microphone problem? You just put it closer maybe. No, 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 it's, uh, it it's meant to be, okay. okay. I totally agree that the other side of the diversification coin is specialization. And I think Jean-Louis Ekra was absolutely right. The problem being that diversification is politically correct. If you talk about diversification on TV or in a dinner speech, people like it. If you talk about what it means, which is specialization, then suddenly people hate it. And why do they hate it? Because they have a sort of feeling that, mm -mm, if that happens, am I going to be the one that get the good specialization and that leaves the rest for the others. So this is a political reality which, which all should have in mind. The good news is that it might have been a problem in the past where in order to reach out to the global economy, to the global market, you needed a sort of full-fledged industrial integration in steel, in cars, in food, in chemicals. The view was that until and unless you don't integrate vertically with a huge input of capital and know-how this needs, there's no way you can do that. The good news is that this is not true anymore. The model now is global supply chain, and global supply chains are much more flexible and entering the, the entry ticket into a global supply chain is much cheaper than it used to be. And this has to be done on the basis of comparative advantage. I mean, I wouldn't advise for a big uh, Soviet-like uh, planned uh, system for the African continent that you specialize in there and you specialize in there. I think business will find the right slot solution segments provided provided public authorities succeed in creating the proper environment for the development of these global supply chains. And then you are back to a simple problem, which is how do you make them work, or more precisely, how do you address the cost of them not working? And this is back to what we just discussed, infrastructures, ports, rail, Airports, no, it's great to explore cut flowers because this is value addition. If you can do the packaging, it's even better. You find a plane to ship this to Rotterdam. The problem is how do you make sure that the plane back is not empty? Logistical issue, but fundamental issue in terms of cost. Same for sanitary standards. So I think the capacity of relatively rapid and low-cost specialization is now there. And then it's up to, again, business to see the necessary initiatives and then, you know, public authorities, regional groupings, uh, governments sort of create a proper environment for that. And I'm, I'm convinced that with a sort of African entrepreneurial drive, which we've witnessed for the last sort of five to ten years, this will happen as it happened in Asia. Uh, remember, uh, 
Malaysia in the 70s, 80s had the view that Malaysia needed to build a Malaysian car, Proton. They spent billions of dollars trying to do that. Yes. Couldn't do it for obvious reasons. Lost a bit of time, quite a lot of money. And then they are extremely well integrated in the ASEAN supply chains, uh, windscreen for some, uh, tires for others, and it works extremely well. And this will work for Africa, starting, in my view, uh, with, uh, with food. Mackinan, if I could uh, build off of some of what Pascal was, was saying, to, to come back to you know, the coffee example and diversification versus specialization, and one of your points and other panel's points of uh, you know, growth versus development. In your role, can you give us some examples of how you manage some things that, for example, you know, Ethiopia is, is very adept at and very good at while managing a, a growth trajectory that makes sense, taking advantage of other countries' expertise or specialization in other areas? Is there a way that you can tie it together with an example for us? Yeah, I think the, um, the most important thing is um, to have a national policy development policy and uh, <clears throat> where your comparative advantage lies. Mm -hmm. uh, so the issue is production capacity to produce on a scale and at competitive price, which you can sell not only to your neighbor, but you can sell it to uh, Europe, to China. Uh, so the central element is to have the productive capacity different products, adding value to your uh, natural resources. Mm -hmm. uh, and we have said the infrastructure is most important. We feel in terms of our development policy, labor intensive, agricultural resource based like laser industries, shoes, textiles, agro-processing. All of these are broad, but you can specialize. You can diversify your products from coffee to manufacturing exports and manufacture is quite wide. Mm -hmm. And uh, we emphasize on uh, laser industries, textiles, agro-processing, chemicals, as Pascal Lamy said, and pharmaceuticals, which are strategic import substitutions. Mm -hmm. And once you create your domestic industrial base with diversified products, then you will be able to trade competitively, not only to Kenya or Sudan, but also to to other countries. So it's important to have a national vision, a national development, prioritize depending on your comparative advantage. At early stage, we have a young population, educate them, they will be innovative, they will be productive. And then uh, you provide them with the right environment, the infrastructure, the institutional support, then it will evolve dynamically and uh, you'll be able to sell uh, competitively. Mm. Uh, Dr. Iso, do you, do you find you have the same issues in terms of competitive advantage versus local specialization and finding, for example, low-cost barriers into this global supply chain? In fact, uh, competitiveness by itself is something which is very positive. If Africa Africa can't trade with other world unless they have competitive commodities. Therefore, if Africa widened their commodities and increased its competitiveness, the, effect, the negative effect of having the same product between some countries will be less. The share of the negative effect will be less. Therefore, policies to increase production either for agricultural products or for industrial products, and to have competitiveness for these products, not only between African countries, but between African countries and other countries all over the world. This is the way which Africa can solve the employment. They can have solutions to feed themselves, to have food security. Therefore, even if we have some negative effects will not be that much. This is, can be evaluated if we are limiting our products in very few products and we are competing 
in all this, in, in, in these few numbers of commodities. Therefore, still we say that no other areas they manage to coordinate or to integrate in their products. They compete, but the competition is in the sake of everyone. Therefore, I can't see much problem in having a lack of such coordination because, of course, each country, we should confess, each country is looking for its economy, is looking for its benefit. Therefore, exploiting the, uh, the overall move of uh, the African countries towards uh, aims for countries, uh, for Africa. We talked last meeting of AU about the continent free area. If they, Africa, have such free area, they will be having benefits which can cover such negative effects. Therefore, Africa has a lot to do, as I said again, uh, by themselves to solve such uh, problems. But I can see this is as a major problem based on that Africa is, will be doing other things to improve its economy and improve its trade between themselves and between Africa and other world. Mm. Jay, I wanted to come back uh, to your comments about biofuels, that they're both controversial, the concept is controversial. I wonder if you could elaborate on what about it is controversial and, and how it relates to freeing up trade specifically. Well, <laughs> yeah, um, I mean, there is the whole global debate of food versus fuel. And uh, I mean, there's no other better place than uh, in parts of Africa where there is surplus land and they're spending a lot of their valuable foreign exchange uh, on importing uh, oil, which, uh, you know, is one of the, you know, most important uh, foreign exchange uh, drains uh, on all these countries. So I think the countries which particularly have, and, and it creates a cash crop. Now, if you have a landlocked country, which is exporting food uh, and importing oil, uh, you know, at some point, uh, you know, it's not uh, going to be competitive in the global markets if you need to export soybean from Zambia, for that matter, or corn. It, it's not viable. They need to ship it to Durban. It's thousands of miles away. They need to, on the other hand, import all their oil and derivatives of oil uh, from Durban all the way to the port. Now, it doesn't make any sense. Rather than, uh, you know, they, they need to look at uh, biofuels. They need to have a biofuel policy. They will, for, for the local farmers, this is, when you sell uh, an agriculture commodity, uh, it's priced based on CIF Durban, you know, the prices uh, 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 at the port. Uh, and, and he has to sell it much cheaper to to be competitive, and he loses a lot of money on the transport costs, etc. So uh, I believe that you know these countries particularly need to to relook at their strategy, look at their policies, and uh, I believe that it'll make a lot of sense for the local farmers to switch part of their production uh, to something which is consumed locally and uh, which they are importing. Mm. Pascal, did you indicate you had something to follow on comment? I mean, I think Jay is perfectly right. The problem is uh, food versus fuel. Seen from the political side, I would be very careful. Africa is a net fuel exporter. Africa is a net food importer. And that's what frames a large part of the political debate with governments, with uh, civil society. So the notion that Africa as a net food importer should grow more fuel from agriculture, I'm not sure will float extremely well, uh, politically speaking. Uh, it's just a word of caution. I I'm not saying it's good or bad. I'm, I don't know enough of what happens on the ground for that. What I simply say is mm -mm, beware the political 
atmosphere of this issue on a continent mm -hmm. which is seen rightly for the moment by the rest of the world as having a serious food problem. And it's part of your comments that it being controversial, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I guess now would be a good time to see if there's anybody in the audience that has a question or uh, even a comment because uh, I have a feeling that plenty of people in this audience have a particular expertise in these areas of inquiry. Um, we have a question right there then. And if, uh, yeah, you could uh, say where you're from. And if you have a, if it's a generalized question for the whole panel, or if it's for somebody specifically, please let us know. Thank you very much. My name is Niels Flatten. I'm from Westcro in Cape Town. Uh, listening to this debate, it seems like it's a debate centered around strategy, process. If we started that work right now, it would kick in in four, five, six, seven years' time. The debate hasn't focused on the issues that we have at the border posts right now. If you look at certain parts on the continent, at border posts, there's whole cottage industries that have been created for the trucks that are being delayed. And the other thing that I want to say is, I don't think we need policies in place to let sellers and buyers find each other. I think there's already a free flow of goods on the continent. We can just accelerate and speed that. And I think the long-term strategic gain here is, is we allow those people to trade cross-border with each other. We're growing the SME sector, the entrepreneurial class, and I think that's a buffer between a disillusioned youth and a government that might not be delivering services adequately. And then the last comment that I wanted to make is we, we talk about trade, but I think there's other components to it as well. I think we're talking about trade in goods, trades in services, and trade in capital. And the last two, I don't think we need infrastructure or policies in place to kick in uh, cross-border on the continent. So some interesting concepts, both on uh, time frames. And then specifically, uh, you know, flows of services and, uh, and, and capital. But um, Jean-Louis, yeah, I think you I were think, talking about capital. I think if I may intervene here, uh, trading capital is not as uh, straightforward as uh, it, it might appear. Because there are certain countries in uh, this continent we still do not have a free uh, exchange rate system where you can freely send money in and out. So, uh, yes, basically and generally, uh, all the regional agreements uh, include a free movement of uh, capital services and even people. But then you need to go to the implementation of it. And that is where you find all the, uh, the difficulties. Because in implementing it, you find out that many of those countries are still not transform an international uh, commitment into local uh, law. <laughs> and uh, it, it creates difficulties to freely move this money. Sometimes it is easier to have a trade of capital between an international country, I mean, a European or American country, uh, rather than between African countries themselves. So, um, uh, yes, it doesn't require infrastructure per se, but it requires policy. And uh, policy uh, as such is also part of the infrastructure. I think earlier we did have a hand come up over here. I don't know if we can get a microphone over there. Microphone over here. Yeah, my only is just a, a contribution and to give an example of uh, how we are having a lot of problems in enhancing trade. My name is uh, Robert Oya. I'm the managing director of Nigeria Export Import Bank. I sincerely believe that we need to involve uh, the private sector in developing infrastructure. I give you an example of what is happening within the, the ECOWA sub-region, that is the Economic Committee of West African State, precisely the West African sub-region. We tend to have the highest transportation and logistic cost. Uh, for the mere fact that we need an efficient sea-going investor or system that we don't have. In the process, it is difficult for us to deepen in trade. It's difficult for us to enhance the current volumes of trade flows. 
And let me give an, a spe very specific example. Some of you that are familiar with um, uh, West Africa, if you have to move your goods, let's say from Lagos to Tema Port in Ghana, by truck, it might take you about six days with all the multiple checkpoints, with all this harassment from security agencies, a lack of improvement in road infrastructure. But if you have to move your goods from the same Lagos, let's say from Tinkan or Papa Port to the same Tema Port in Ghana by sea, it will take you a minimum of 60 days. It will take you that long because we don't have vessels within the region. They will first take your goods to Europe and then do a transshipment of your goods from Europe to deliver them in Ghana. So we actually need the private sector. I don't think the government will be able to help in this, in this, uh, in, in, you know, in this instance. It's the private sector that are the traders and they are the only one that can deepen the regional trade. They are the only one that can enhance the corner volume of, you know, of trade flows you know, that are going on. So I believe that for us to overcome some of these trade barriers, we really need to work as a unit, the private sector, in all the regions. The same problem that we have in West Africa is the same problem that the Central African you know, region is facing. So for us to see that we deepen trade, some of these trade barriers must be addressed. Thank you. So there we had a, a thank you for that. We had, we had a comment on uh, transportation and infrastructure seems to be uh, one of the highest priority problems and, and topics. And here we had a, a perspective that said that he's not particularly confident that government can solve this problem and that private industry is the solution. Is there anybody on the panel that'd like to amplify that, talk about that? Um, you know, is private industry a solution to the transportation and infrastructure problem? I know that U.S. media is particularly obsessed with the Chinese and the Chinese infrastructure that's going in in Sudan and other places. Uh, would anybody like to, to elaborate more on solutions, creative, obvious, or otherwise, about some of the infrastructure and transportation issues? I yes, think uh, no one can object to what he is saying, actually. Transportation Africa is not acquainted to accomplish the volume of trade between African countries. And there was some thought to have a road between Egypt and up to South Africa and some other road to be in the... One of the obstacles actually to move goods through Africa we practice in Egypt for Egyptian goods is transportation. The problem is financing. Who will be financing such road? I think having talks between African countries through the AU or whatever the, the respons responsible people will be talking about. Solving this problem will solve many other problems because it's not only transportation, it, it is an I, an I, IT information, energy, many other things which is uh, an infrastructure which is totally needed to improve trade between Africa. But this is real. Pascal, yes, you indicated. No. I, I think on this, let's be very pragmatic uh, and look at quick wins, low-hanging fruit. Uh, take one example which I discussed and sort of handled with uh, President uh, Kikwete. Port of Mombasa, uh, of Dar es Salaam, jammed. So the sort of immediate view is that this port is too small, should be expanded. And then you go into big projects and you start counting $1 billion, $2 billion, $3 billion, and then whoop. Now, let's go back to the reality. The reality is that some years ago, it would take 25 days to clear a container in the port of Dar es Salaam, which of course, is a problem for the capacity of the port. Uh, because during 25 days, the containers are there, and you can't put unload more. Now, instead of you know, looking at the sort of final nirvana solution, obviously, why don't we try and rotate these containers much more quickly so that there is available space? Now, rotating the containers from 
25 days to five days is a question of political authority coordination on the nine agencies who are operating within the perimeter of the port of Dar es Salaam. The port authority, customs, security, uh, sanitary and fighter sanitary inspection, I mean, you know that. Once these people are around the table and somebody says, okay, let's cooperate in order to reduce from you do this, you do, it works. Investment, a few hours of administrative coordination and somebody in the system that says, I want you guys to work together. And who immediately this, the ball starts rolling and customs realize that, you know, if they do their thing in another way, then the sanitary people will be happy and then the police people will be happy and, and then you start the ball rolling. And many of these things can happen very, very, very easily. Now, it's not the whole problem, but you know, if you reduce the time it takes to clear a container by 20 days in a few months, you've done a great thing for boosting trade for Africa. So my advice is, you know, the grand designs are fine, the grand strategies are necessary because people have to know with which framework they operate, but start with the identification, of, a bit like what the, the International Trade Center does uh, when it does a, a program uh, to help uh, exporting uh, mangoes. Uh, then you have to look at whether the tree is good quality, whether it's cropped in the right way, whether there's a bit of cold warehousing available, whether the thing which will ship, it's little things. Uh, but if you fix them, these bottlenecks, which are sort of soft bottlenecks, not hard bottlenecks, that disappear. So there's a lot to be done. I mean, take another example. I, I witnessed this in the, in the southern part of Africa. Two countries have a border post. Uh, one country uh, says uh, it's open from 6 o'clock in the morning to 6 o'clock in the evening. Uh, and another country says, no, no, mine is open 8 o'clock in the morning to 8 o'clock in the evening. Well, fine. The reality is that the thing is open from 8 o'clock in the morning to 6 o'clock in the evening, and there are four hours while customs officials on both sides do absolutely nothing. Now, it seems to be a very small thing, very easy to address. And if you do that, if you harmonize the hours of opening of these two customs systems, then your, your, lorry, your lorry file uh, will be reduced by one third. We're starting to run out of time, so I'm going to check with uh, the audience again. Are there any other questions that have come up through this debate? Yes, we have a question there midway back. And then we'll get to yours on the... Oh, no, I was speaking about the, the woman here, but we'll, we'll get this one first. No, that's okay. Stay there, and then we'll, we'll come back in the pink after that. Adam Green, I'm a reporter for This Is Africa magazine at the Financial Times. I had a question for Mr. Lamy. You spoke a bit earlier about how businesses in Africa were not mobilizing in favor of uh, trade openness in the same way as other regions. Do you have any sense as to why? Well, I mean, I think Jean-Louis Ekra, who was one of the driving forces behind the creation of this Pan-African uh, trade constituency, could answer, uh, I mean, I think there are basically two reasons. First one is that still in many African countries, competition is not yet the rule of the game. So the feeling is that if you've got to lobby your government to ease trade, you're going to do that to ease your trade and maybe not your neighbor's trade. Not least because this gives you a comparative advantage. Second, very simply, entrepreneurs in Africa have so much on their plate to grow their business, and there is such an amount of potential there that you know they do what they believe is where they use most of usefully their time. And the notion that they would have to structure and spend time to you know have a bit of a 
have a research study and then go to governments, that's simply not there. So it's, it's in a way good reasons, but as a result, my own diagnosis is that there is not enough bottom-up pressure from business on politicians for politicians to address this as a priority. Thank you. Am I right? No problem. I, I, I totally agree with that. That's, that's the, the idea behind the creation of, of Path Track. will be also giving capacity to African entrepreneurs to understand more international trade issues because very few of them do understand uh, those issues. When the government go and sign certain agreements, they are not consulted. So it's important that they also build the capacity in those issues so that they can put pressure on the government to go and negotiate things that are also in their favor. Right. Yes, we did have a question here in the middle. Thank you. My name is Anne McCormick from Diageo. We're known as Guinness or Tusker. Um, I was interested in some of the comments. This is for the whole panel. And I would like to dig a little bit deeper behind this question of being pragmatic, um, political motivation, the role of business. Uh, we operate across Africa. We can get goods from one country to another. Sometimes it takes weeks, sometimes it's quick. And I was asking myself, you know, we lobby, we do many things to try to <coughs> unlock this. It takes ages, even in the EAC. And I was thinking about the experience I had in the last two days, talking with Grow Africa, looking at what's done in agriculture, the drive we've created with SACOT, what's happening with the ATA in Ethiopia these days. And I was wondering why these green channels are not replicating or working. Why aren't they developing faster? We're involved in the work with the World Bank on the Abidjan-Lagos corridor. Doesn't seem to be moving particularly fast. Is there an opportunity to take a, an approach like that of Grow Africa to really focus on a few low-hanging fruit, put political will, the right organization, cross-sectorial, cross-government uh, ministries, prove the point, prove the benefits, build the value, and therefore start creating some momentum? You know, I think when there's uh, drive and focus, some of these challenges are not as complicated as they might seem, if I compare with agriculture. Thank you. Thank you. So would anybody like to address that or take that? Or? Any takers? I, I think it's more, more, more a comment than really comment. A, yeah. a, a question. Okay. Uh, clearly, if... A, a, specific, a specific approach is adopted, the likelihood to get results will be higher. And I totally agree with you that they should be, uh, we should replicate certain lobby that have uh, been uh, uh, designed in other area to uh, replicate them into trade. And, and that's, a, again, the idea of path track. Okay. Um, well, thank you. We only have about 10 minutes left, and so in the final 10 minutes, um, I'm going to ask each of the panelists if they'd either have something in summation or one point that they felt wasn't gotten across or something that they'd like to, to amplify. Uh, so, so Mekinen, I'll, uh, I'll start with you. Is there one area or aspect where you felt like you either learned something new or um, was one of the more striking things that you heard or something that you know, you'll take back to your own constituency and stakeholders? Um, I think what I heard is the issues are not new, really. Um, the issue is how to get done what we have agreed mm -hmm. and what we have set as, as direction. I think in terms of time frame, uh, it's always good to look for uh, early quick wins by analyzing uh, the value chains from the production to the market. You will identify uh, constraints that will be easily solved through co better coordination, better uh, administrative uh, efficiency. So in terms of time frame, identifying quick wins 
uh, which is most important and emphasized in the, in the panel. Uh, the second thing is there are real capacity constraints on the infrastructure side. If there is no road, if there is no uh, railroad, you can't move goods, you can't move people. Mm -hmm. uh, so you, the issue of infrastructure is basic. We have to increase competitiveness and also increase inter-African trade. Mm -hmm. uh, the third uh, important point in terms of summation is institutional capacity. People as a customs, custom institutions, the right skill of the people, the systems that they use, all matters in terms of either delaying or uh, adding uh, speed to the clearance of uh, uh, the goods. Um, and finally, I think the most important is we have to link trade with investment, productive capacity. There has to be diversified products that we can sell. Mm. So uh, the challenge is similarity of goods. So we have to diversify, add value to our national resources. So investment and trade has to go. Trade matters, but it, is, it matters only if it advances mm -hmm. growth and development. And there, the productive capacity, private sector role, creating the right environment for the private sector to, to add value, mm. to increase uh, production capacity, product mix is important. Thank you. Pascal, final thoughts? Yeah, I mean, what we heard this afternoon, I think, points in one direction, which is a combination of a sort of pull-push. Um, the traditional approach is the one uh, Minister McConnell just mentioned, there is, behind this low intra-African trade, a main issue, which is capacity, whether it's infrastructure, whether it's hardware capacity, whether it's software capacity. True, this needs to be addressed. It's for Africa, countries, regions to set up their priorities, list what has to be done, and then do it. And it's for support like what the World Bank, the International Trade Center, the WTO, UNDP, UNIDO, this we can support. And it's not a problem of the resources not being there. Resources are there. The big lesson in what we call aid for trade in the WTO for the last seven years is once countries have their priorities clear and right, money is not the problem. Now, that's the first approach, and it needs to be done because a lot of that has to do with regulatory frameworks and, again, with heavy infrastructure. Now, I think what's happening also, and there was a good example yesterday with the sort of Grow Africa WEF initiative, that's more bottom-up. It's more a question of creating a platform which connects supply, demand, uh, people who have needs, uh, people who have resources, so it's, it's a bit more messy, it's less sort of, you know, visible and communicable, but the experience shows that it works. I think this, this session yesterday, which was uh, sort of organized under the, the umbrella of the uh, AU, of the African Union on Grow Africa, shows that just by providing the platform that allows this sort of connection, it works. Take the example with what happened in uh, Addis with this commodities exchange. Uh, that was not something the Prime Minister decided should be done. That was a necessity. Somebody with a formidable energy said that's what you should do, and it happened. So it's, it's a combination. And I think there is now enough energy attention on Africa for these sort of things to catalyze. Mm -hmm. It's going to be a bit messy, but you know, the important thing is not that we can draft this in nice pictures. Huh? The important thing is that it happens. Dr. Issa, is there a couple of points that you'll take with you today? In fact, uh, and in short, I feel that Africa is a rich continent by its land, by its climate, by many other things. I think what we lack is seriousness to follow up and to implement 
such talks which have been done previously and as this event is the first event to be done in Africa, I think the recommendations of such event, I think if it is put as a roadmap to be submitted or to be forward to the AU just to have seriousness and to have uh, goodwill for, for commitment, for policies, to have not all what we have discussed to be implemented, but at least major things which uh, prohibit Africa from being able to trade by, uh, by them, African countries to trade by uh, themselves between each other. Therefore, I think putting this as an action, not an action plan, because action plans mean that we have something rigid in our but seriousness, goodwill, roadmap. I think we will be starting something good for Africa and the benefits of what we are talking about today and tomorrow will be in the benefit of having this event in mm. Africa. Thank you. Right. Jay? <laughs> yeah, I think uh, the take home here uh, from some of the comments in the audience, I think, you know, there is a lot of talk about uh, Africa big, uh, being global supplier of food, you know, of course the mining, oil, all that uh, is, is, you know, it's a center for that. But unless uh, the governments really focus on making uh, the business environment more competitive, uh, that's going to be very difficult to, to achieve. Um, with some of the comments about the transportation, we all know that and uh, you know about shipping to the neighboring and in, unless you can not unless you can capture the regional markets you cannot be a global player so if you're not a leader in your home market uh, it's impossible for you to compete in uh, in in foreign markets and uh, you know th there is a lot of talk about uh, the population you know doubling in the next uh, 30 40 years uh, you know unless these barriers are dealt with and there is political will. And I guess there are uh, initiatives like Grow Africa. Uh, they may, you may have to divert that to, you know, making Africa more competitive generally across rather than just agriculture. Mm. And Jean-Louis, if yes. I <clears throat> well, keep it I, to a couple of minutes, we're going to come out exactly on time. Yes, no, I think <laughs> the, 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 there's a clear idea that if the private sector uh, moves and put pressure on the uh, policy makers, something might happen. I take simply the five economic regions in the continent. There are agreements that have been signed there, but those agreements are just not implemented. Who is going to push government to implement it? It's the private sector, because it is the private sector, in the last resort, who will be the beneficiary of those economies of scales. So uh, what I want to take out is, is, is that, is that there, there should be a, a role for the private sector to push the policy makers to uh, stick to their words. Excellent. Uh, well, on that note, I want to thank our panelists uh, for joining me here up on the stage and for their uh, really illuminating discussion. And I want to thank our audience for being here with us today. And uh, thank you once again, and I hope you enjoyed it. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you.